talking today about uh, missionary correspondence that uh, the apostles, others were led by God to write, inspired by God to write these messages. And we've been emphasizing all quarter about God's one purpose in writing the Bible for us is to give us instructions as to how we can be saved. He's reaching out to man. That's, that's God's message over and over and over again. So uh, before we get started with class, let's uh, begin with a prayer. Our Father in God, we are so very, very thankful that we're blessed enough to be in your family and that you've taken time, you've taken thought, you've made plans and preparations, and you've reached out to us by providing us with your Son who came to this earth and lived a life of perfection and uh, went and suffered the punishment that we justly deserve and rose victoriously from the grave. We are truly thankful that we know that and that we're a part of that and that you've reached down and shared your purpose to save us with that very message and that very process. We pray that you'll watch over us today, help us to be good examples for you. We're asking you to open our minds and our eyes to see the wonderful things you have in store for us in your word and that you'll guide our thoughts in our discussion today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to start out as we have every class here with some flashcard questions just to see if you guys are awake yet. Um, all right, number one, which, of the apost which one of the apostles worked for the Romans as a tax collector? Matthew or Levi, okay? Matthew chapter 10 and verse 3 tells us this. All right, number two. What is being lamented in the book of Lamentations? Go ahead, just answer up as soon as you got it. <laughs> what? Okay, the destruction of Jerusalem. Exactly, the city of Jerusalem. It's really a, a funeral dirge for the city of Jerusalem, uh, the Lamentations are. All right, question number three. What prophet said that he got a headache when God revealed his plan to him? He said, my head hurts. That's actually, depending on the translation, who? Anybody? What? Oh, I thought I heard Daniel. Daniel, right? Good, okay. All right, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 15. Number four, you guys got to wake up here, okay? Number four, who was the last king in Judah? Now, I could have asked the first king. We asked that before. Who was, who was Israel's first king? God was, okay? And they rejected God and they appointed Saul, okay? So, who was the last king? <laughs> Well, kind of, sort of, but no. No, because they kind of kicked him out, really. It's Zedekiah, okay, or Mataniah, 2 Kings chapter 24. All right, are, are these the harder ones that you said I'm not supposed to ask? Okay, all right, that's what I was wondering. All right, number five, where was the first encampment that the Jews found once they crossed over the Jordan River? What city? Man, I thought some of these would just come right to the top. Gilgal, okay. What, 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 well, <laughs> I created the questions, that's right. <laughs> okay, well, like I announced a couple of weeks ago, if you don't like the questions, you're welcome to come up here and teach, okay? <laughs> so, all right, number, uh, number six, this is for the men only, so this is kind of a big clue again, as we've done each time, men only. What is the name of the man that Ruth ended up marrying after her first husband died? Wow, I got some two two guys knew that one. Okay, good. Number seven. Where is the following verse found in the Bible? Okay. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans three twenty three. Okay. This one's a little tougher. What two chapters in the New Testament are almost identical? Why 
watch that live today. I heard somebody say something. Um, no, as a matter of fact, <laughs> he did not. Jude and Second Peter, what chapter, Melissa? <laughs> the correct one. Okay. <laughs> you are exactly right. You, you, you have an amazing husband. I'm, I'm just, I can tell by your answer. Okay. All right. Number nine. Who asked Jesus how a grown man can re-enter his mother's womb and be born again? Nicodemus, John chapter 3 and verse 4. All right. Last one. Number 10. Back in the prophets again, okay? What prophet asked God why he wasn't doing anything? And God replied this, Look among the nations, watch and be horrified. Be frightened, speechless, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, which if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. Yes, Habakkuk chapter 1 and at verse 5. Okay, you win a prize, whoever... Oh, okay, James... You gave the answer and Cheryl said it, so, <laughs> okay. All right, so let's talk about, we're talking about today um, reaching out to evangelists, and we're looking at these missionary correspondents, as I mentioned, so we're going to be in what books would you figure? Timothy and Titus, okay, as it says up there on the screen. So let's look at the first thing here, and one of the things that God was trying to do when he when he's reaching out to man, in, in 1 Timothy, the first chapter, he says that verse 3, uh, it instructs certain people not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to useless speculation rather than advance the plan of God. Why would that be, with that verse in mind, why would that be important if, we're, if God's purpose is to reach out to man and to save man? Why would that be important? Okay. Okay, so there's a, it's a warning that you don't just fill in other things that there's just not extra teaching that's not from God. And so Timothy, you need to make sure that you stand for the truth and you help others. Instruct certain people, don't teach that, that's false, or that's, that we don't have any knowledge of that. We don't have the ability to know whether this is the case or not. Don't let them teach these strange doctrines because that's not the way of God. I mean, Timothy and Titus, there's a lot within them talking about holding on to sound doctrine, staying the course. Don't, don't deviate from the pattern, which to a preacher, to an evangelist, that message is tremendously important because if I preach certain things, I could get a following, right? I mean, that, that would follow me and like me and pay me and take care of me. That's a, that's a problem that's happened. Huh? Well, and it's happened all through the Bible as well. I mean, false prophets were, uh, the pro true prophets were warned about false prophets over and over again because they just go out and do what they do. They preach a message that you want to hear. They tickle your ears, whatever. Uh, so, the Spirit tells them, God tells them, tells Timothy, be careful and instruct men to teach what is true, not to deviate from that, not, not to get off into endless genealogies, which would mean a whole lot to, to Jewish believers. Well, I come from this tribe, I come from this stock, this family. That's not what's important as far as our walk with God is concerned today. Um, so, what are they supposed to do? Look in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul gives instruction for what Timothy needs to do. In fact, I would suggest to you all preachers that they need to do. Chapter 4 and verse 6, instruct the brethren. Chapter 4 and verse 7, reject profane and old wives' fables. Verse 7, exercise yourself to godliness. Verse 11, command and teach these things. Verse 12, be an example to the believers. Uh, verse 13, give attention to reading. Verse 14, chapter 4 again, 1 Timothy 4, don't neglect the gifts that you have that have been given unto you. Chapter 4 and verse 15, meditate on these things. 
and verse 16, take heed to yourself. All of those critically important messages for somebody who's going to be preaching. Going to go out and preach and teach, you need to make sure that you're doing what you need to do before you try to instruct others in what they're supposed to do. So, so Paul says, by the Spirit of God, you teach them, but you reject these things. You make sure you're living a good and godly life. You're doing these, don't neglect the gifts you have, but meditate, study, learn these things so that you can get up and, and preach and teach. I can tell you today, I mean, as far as, as far as getting up and preaching, once a person does it a few times, that's not really the hardest, that's the easiest part about preaching. Uh, and you can go online and you can get tens of thousands of sermon outlines if you wanted to and say, okay, well, here's the sermon outline. I'll get up and, and just preach it. Take five minutes of preparation, look over the verses, read. The, okay, Th that's not what preaching is. He's talking here about putting yourself into it. Give attention to reading. You, you, preachers today don't have this gift of the Holy Spirit in that way, miraculously, of giving knowledge. Have to read, have to study, have to meditate, have to think. And then have to get up and teach. That is the responsibility that they have. But it's not just standing for the truth. Paul also tells, um, tells Timothy that you are to appoint spiritual leaders. Okay, It's a trustworthy statement, chapter 3 and verse 1, uh, that if any man aspires to the office of an overseer, it's a fine work that he desires to do. And then he gives the qualities of what a man should look like who is to be appointed or can be appointed in a church as an elder or a shepherd or a bishop or a pastor, an overseer, superintendent, all these different words that are for the same role or the same position. But what would you say? How would you describe what God says an elder is supposed to be or a bishop is supposed to be? I mean, tell me, tell me your words. He gives a description of what he needs to look like, but tell me what, he, what you think. What's that? Okay, well, he uses that word, but I'm saying in, our own, in your words, what, what do you think he needs to be? Who, who is he? Okay, yeah, he's not, going to be, he's not going to be a superman or a super Christian necessarily, but he is a man, okay? If a man desires the office or the purpose or role of being a, a bishop. And then he has these qualities that he lists behind them. So, so he's what? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it should, the name should float up to the top kind of it within a group. It shouldn't be one of these, oh, well, I never thought about him as being this kind of person. Um, it, it, it's usually the names kind of float to the surface and you look and you say, okay, yeah, he has these qualities. That, that's the kind of man he is. And, and you see that. Or no, that's not the kind of man he is. And so regardless of how successful he might be in business or whatever venture, that doesn't make him qualified to be an elder. But he's talking about this. But why would this be important? Okay, so let's ask this question. Since we're talking about God reaching out to man, why would it be important for God to say, appoint spiritual leaders in a church? Okay? The flock depends on them, Steve says. What, what would you say? Anybody? Okay, to be an encourager? Okay. Okay. Uh, and the, the primary role of a shepherd is what? To make decisions? No, that, that's usually, if I ever, if I hear any prayers about the elder, almost, I should, not any, virtually every prayer that I ever hear vocal in a group gathering of any kind, prays for the elders and the decisions they make. Well, there's no question elders make decisions, but we all make decisions. And sometimes they make important decisions, sometimes they make wrong decisions, I understand that. But more than anything else, it's not that they're deciders, but they should be leaders, shepherds, in the sense of caring for the spiritual needs of the flock. And know the Word. That's right. So they're, they're able to, as Timothy is told, and Titus, to convict those who are not teaching the Word. Yeah. So they have to be knowledgeable, they, and they need to be men who are willing to go out front and lead the way. And to say, here, follow, follow after me. John chapter 10 is a great example of Jesus being the good shepherd and the sheep who know his name and follow behind him. But if a church doesn't have elders, which 
there's countless thousands of them across this land and other lands as well. Um, are they, so, so tell me about those congregations. As a rule, what's, what's, what's missing? What's lacking there? Yeah, well, sometimes it's qualified men. Sometimes it's we won't let them be qualified. I've seen that in churches. I mean, we, we make the rules more stringent than God sometimes. Okay, yeah, and, and it just becomes a whole lot harder. It's not that a church can't function. Don't get me wrong. Thousands and thousands of churches function without elders. But Paul, when he wrote Titus, which we'll look at um, in just a few minutes, but he did say, appoint those who are lacking, appoint elders in every church, because there's a lack, there's a need there within the congregation. And so hopefully men will grow and mature and develop to the point that they can and should be appointed as spiritual leaders. But without that, evangelism is going to suffer, fellowship is going to suffer as, as a rule, and I realize there's exceptions to all of this. Um, so what's the difference between an elder and a deacon? Because Paul's going to talk to him about deacons too. Okay, well, elders should be hands-on helping with the people, right? So, that, I mean, what's, what is the difference between the two? Yes, sir, David. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I would be a little hesitant to say that they make the final decision. I'm going to say God makes the final decision in His Word, and and best best we can do is the best we can do. You know, if you've got three men, five men, however many men as shepherds in a group, and they're going to do the best they can. But uh, go ahead, Edwin. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think that's a great example in Acts chapter 6. I do think those are the first deacons in the church. And that goes along with what David said, goes along with what Steve said in the sense of the hands-on. I mean, the word is a servant or a table waiter is what a deacon is. It's one who takes care of those particular needs. And we tend to, as a rule, I don't know that how accurate that actually is, we tend to make their work more physical and, and elders more spiritual. But a lot of churches, they do just the opposite. I mean, it just depends. Go ahead, David. Okay. And Acts 6 is a good example. The apostles knew that caring for the widow was important. Was an yeah. expectation. Yeah. And so, but he said it's not right that we should be like, preaching to serve tables. So they knew what the what the why was. Okay. He said you will come to the seven men who told their spirit to figure out how. Right. Yeah, and it's interesting uh, to go along with that. You're right. And just you take care of this. We don't have the minutiae behind how, what they decided, how they decided to go about it. It was turning it over, which is a great, great principle as well for elders and deacons. Uh, um, Joan, you were going to say something? Okay, yeah, we, it's, it's not a part of their qualities that are listed. Yeah, deacons can teach or preach or whatever, but you're right. It, it, there is an expectation, as Elaine had said earlier, that, that elders can hold people accountable because of knowing the truth. 
and the way that they're, the truth is presented. But we all have a role in all of these things. Christy? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there are all kind of different ways to serve, and that's as much a spiritual service as anything else is. So it's not just physical things that we sometimes think of regarding deacons. He also tells them to set a good example, but stay away from worthless stories that are typical of old women. That's kind of the way the, the New American Standard writes this. Uh, rather, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. No, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example to those who believe. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Some, just some select verses out of 1 Timothy chapter 4, chapter 6. Set a good example. All of, all of these matters that God wants to reach out to man, and if his, one of his spokesmen, one of his preachers, is not living as he should, then what does that do for evangelism? Huh? Taints it. It might even just completely stop it dead in its tracks, depending on who the person is. Okay, so we have to make sure that it's done in ways that are honorable before God, that we live our lives. He gives more instruction. Chapter 5 and verse 1, treat older men with respect. Don't rebuke them. Exhort them as a father. Chapter 5 and verse 1, treat younger men as brothers. Chapter 5 and verse 2, treat older women with respect as mothers. Verse 2, treat younger women as sisters with all purity. Honor widows, verse 3, enroll older godly ones, encourage them, and the younger ones encourage to get married as far as widows go. Respect those who are elders. Don't share in the wrongdoings of others. On and on and on he gives instruction to Timothy. So Timothy's not above this. He's not above the law. It's not like, well, I'm, I'm a preacher. I don't have to worry about that. That wasn't Timothy. He's told, live this way. Be this kind of person. Because God wants to reach more and more and more people. He wants to reach out to the lost. He wants people to be saved. So if a person is preaching a pure gospel and living an impure life, what does that say to the world? He's a hypocrite. I'm not interested in what he says. I can find hypocrites anywhere. So I, I should be able to find purity or, or honor and respect at, within the people of God. That's how it should be. So Timothy's given these instructions. So Titus now. He's told, appoint spiritual leaders as well. Even though he's in a different place entirely, he's on the island of Crete, off of the, off of the nation of Greece, about 140 miles or so uh, east to west, and at its fattest, I guess, it's about 30 miles. Um, it was a notorious place for mercenaries to live, for hire. They would, people would go to Crete. They are known to be liars and manipulators of people. In fact, Paul quotes from one of their own poets that says they're always liars. I pointed out the other day in the Thursday class we were going through some of this that there's a Greek word, kritizo, which means to be a liar, which literally means to be like a Cretan. And so, that's how notorious they were. Uh, so, he says appoint leaders because look again at verse 5 there. Um, For this reason I left you in Crete that you would set in order those things that remain, or the old translation says those things that are lacking in the church, to set those in order and appoint elders uh, as I directed you. So again, the importance of this. But there's a difference if you read 1 Timothy's list that we did look, just touch on, 1 Timothy 3, and you read Titus' list in Titus chapter 1, they're not identical. There are some differences between the two. So, why are there two sets of lists, or two, two lists, if you will? Could you be qualified to be an elder in one place and not qualified to be an elder in another place?
Okay, I, I think I definitely well, would agree with you because it's a perception within the group anyway that we're, we're trying to make a decision, the best decision that we can make. I mean, there's a lot of judgment that goes involved in appointing elders, right, in a church. Okay, I mean, you look at most of the qualities that are listed, they're not just black or white, cut or dry, here it is, yes or no. You look and you say, yeah. Okay, it says he has, he has an a, he's apt to teach. Okay, you've sat under a lot of teachers and heard different teachers, and you probably could say this one or that one didn't really have an aptitude to teach, right? You, you've, you've sat there and wondered as the paint was drying, how long was it going to be till the class was over, or whatever the case is. And you've sat there and you've wondered, and, wait, and you said, well, this guy's not really, or this woman, not really gifted. Uh, and others you've heard and you've been spellbound when they've talked or taught. Um, so you have to use judgment in that, right? And you might have, as Drew's pointing out, you might have a different background entirely. Somebody who was raised in a more rural neighborhood, a more rural setting, he moves to a college town, and there's a church made up of college professors and, and, and so on and so forth. They may, they may not, I'm not saying he's not, but they may not feel like he's qualified to be a leader for them. So we have to use judgment in this. So why are there two sets of lists? I mean, they're very similar. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they're, different. they're that different. Very similar, but why would they be different? It could be, depending on the location of where they are. Sure, that there's something that's, this really needs to be emphasized here, this needs to be emphasized there. I think more than that, I mean, one of the things that I've tried to suggest is, I think the word, we've overused the word qualifications. Um, I think that the word quality maybe is better, that we're looking for this quality of an individual. And so it's going to be very similar in that regard. But you have to use your judgment, I have to use my judgment when I say yes or no. Richard? Yeah, if that's the, if that's the most accurate translation of the word must, but yeah, I would, I would say these things, there are things that are, that are unbending, maybe we might say, but I'm saying that we use judgment in how we look at these things anyway. This person is holy, he's blameless, he's apt to teach, he's this, he's that, the other. We kind of have to look and value judgment these things. So one place may feel like, no, he's not qualified. I, I can't follow him as my leader. Other places say, absolutely, he's, he's, he's the very best. Uh, but I want you to notice this next thing before we get too far off of this, and that is he says in chapter 2 and verse 1, speak sound doctrine, but as for you, proclaim the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Okay, So there is a clarion call that goes out in Timothy and Titus. Preachers need to make sure they're preaching truth. Not to deviate, not to get off into this, into that, what you think, what you feel, what you heard, what you read, but preaching truth. Proclaim those things which are fitting for sound, or your version may say healthful or healthy doctrine. And that's the, the, the teaching, the word doctrine and teaching, same thing, sound teaching or healthy teaching. Make sure that that is. So how do you know if something's sound or healthful or not? Yeah, I mean, we, we've got it right here, right? So I, I have to look and see, and I need to be knowledgeable enough to say, I've not heard that before. Um, let me see what the Bible says on that and take my own personal uh, journey of study as well. So soundness of doctrine, absolutely critical in reaching out to man because if it's false doctrine, it's not leading us to God. It's not providing us the salvation that God is offering to us if it's false. Dave? In addition, this person said that he has been admonished by the Lord to preach in contrast to what he said in a
Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. That both of them are equally important. And if again, if writing to this guy, who this one who is a preacher, that his job is going to be to try to reach out to people if his orthodoxy or his orthopraxy either one or off. What does that do to his work? And well, it's going to hinder him greatly. Maybe, in fact, destroy his work, the way that he conducts himself. And then the the, the, the bottom verse there in chapter uh, three, verse ten and eleven: reject a divisive person after a first and second warning, knowing that such a person has deviated from what is right and is sinning. This is a tremendously difficult part to do, as far as preaching and teaching and eldering or serving as a shepherd of a congregation is to do the things that need to be done with the intent of the whole congregation, but now looking and saying, okay, this is somebody who is divisive. So let me ask you, is all division wrong? No, of course not. Okay, There could be any number of device, division that could be right. A divisive person, though, is who? Your, what, your wife, did you say? Oh, <laughs> I thought you said your wife. I thought, wow, okay. Okay, okay. We were going to have a counseling session a little bit later. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, stop class right now. Okay, yeah, it's a my way or the highway attitude, okay? Uh, this divisive person is somebody who, who a lot of times uses truth, and they use just enough of either themselves or false doctrine to sprinkle into that truth, that begins to create this wedge within a group, begins to divide a group. Go ahead, Drew. Uh, right. Okay, that's exactly right. Yeah, and and I mean the healthy unhealthy is a good picture, although. Although we all know that, we just don't necessarily live by that standard in our own life. I mean, we know this food is healthy and this food is not healthy. And Melissa said, I said, what are we having yesterday? So what are we having for lunch today? And she said, uh, I've got a salad and some turkey on the salad that you had, that, you know, you had smoked before, was in the freezer and put on the turkey. She said, how's that sound? And I said, what did I say, Melissa? That sounds disgusting, but... <laughs> But I said, that'll be good. So we had salad yesterday with turkey on top. That was, uh, that was definitely more healthful than it was, more healthy uh, than, no, let's go get one of those burgers, you know, where the grease is dripping down your elbows when you're, Steve, you were going to say something. Exactly. That's right. I mean, it goes back to what Elaine had said earlier about their knowledgeable of the Word. Again, it's a critically important point. And the only way to get that is through putting your Bible under your pillow at night, laying to sleep on that, and through osmosis you get that. It doesn't happen like that. I mean, the only way today, if you're going to get some kind of knowledge, is because you put forth effort to study and look at the Word of God. Okay. I mean, as it, simple as that sounds. I mean, that's 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 really where it is. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. And be able to alert somebody to that. Exactly. That's a that's a very good point. The more involved all of us are with one another in the body, the better that works. You know, I've, I've said several times, I've told Jed as well, uh, I don't think he's in here this morning, but uh, I mean, Jed does an excellent job. And I mean, he's a young man and uh, um, hasn't been preaching that terribly long. He does a great job. I said, somebody asked me, I said, well, what does he need? I said, the only thing he needs is time. <laughs> and it is just time to learn more and more and more and more. And that only comes through time. It only comes through time and work and effort. That's right. Well, seasoning. Okay. All right, well, yeah, okay. Jennings, I'm going to ask you to leave class if you keep doing this, all right? Okay, so.
of what? Rejecting a divisive man after a first... I think it is you give him a chance. You give him another chance, and then that's it. it any more than that, it's going to be di so disruptive within the group. Yeah. Uh, Brother Lowell Williams used to say, at least two and no more than two <laughs> chances that you would go and talk to somebody. And, and you try to win them back. Of course, that, that's a principle. You're, you're not trying to cut them off. You're trying to appeal to this person who has this divisive way for him to give that up, give up it teaching or doctrine or whatever it is. Uh, but any of those things that would detract from reaching out to man and man being able to be right with God, then that's why they're warned about this. And beware of the divisive person who would do it. All right, let's look at, uh, uh, did that already? Yes. Oh, no question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, somebody asked me, where did, actually, I had somebody about a month ago ask me, said, where did Jed get all this knowledge? And I said, he's been listening to me preach for years. So no, <laughs> no, I said, I said, obviously it was Trudy because you know it wasn't Wayne. Okay. That's, so that's what I actually answered. Uh, so, so anyway, all right, look at Second Timothy real quick. Be loyal to the truth. Second Timothy chapter one, Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or for me as prisoner. So don't be ashamed of the gospel, what the gospel teaches. Don't, don't apologize for what God's Word teaches. I've heard some preachers or teachers teach a class and make a statement and then almost apologize for what God has said. That There's no place for that. God's Word is what's going to save a person. Romans 1, we've talked about before. Then he says, hold on to the example of sound words, which you have heard from me. In faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus, perfect through the Holy Spirit, perfect through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, and the treasure which has been entrusted to you. So be loyal to the truth. Um, again, there are sound words, healthful teaching, good things, loyalty to soundness of doctrine. Again, absolutely essential. Um, so look in chapter two of Second Timothy, chapter. Uh, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and um, look at verses 24, if I can get to 2 Timothy, 24 through 26, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, skillful in teaching, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So Paul says, uh, uh, Timothy, you, you need to live this kind of life, be gentle, not to be quarrelsome, not to be somebody who's quick to anger and so on. All of these important qualities that you need to have in your life. Those are attitudes that you should possess, humility, so that you can be taught when you are wrong and, and be instructed in that regard. Then he tells him, preach the truth, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, correct and rebuke and exhort with great <clears throat> patience and instruction. For the time will come where they will not, inherit, uh, will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desire. So preach the word, Timothy. When you go preach, preach the word. Preach the truth. Preach those things that are according to what God said. And he tells him when to do that. In season and out of season. Okay, that's when it's convenient, when it's not convenient. It's when things are going well, when things are going poorly. When the church is struggling, when the church is thriving. You, you, you preach the truth, he says. That's the charge. Do it all the time. So how does he do it? Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So um, it's just it's a principle that has to be kept because God's wanting again to reach out to others. Let me get this last point in before we close. 
He tells him in 2 Timothy 2, 2, one of the things, this goes back to what David had mentioned before in, in citing the, the gifts that we are to do and for the work of equipping the saints, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to those who are faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Part of our responsibilities, part of a preacher's especially, is to teach others so that they can teach others who can teach others who can teach others. It's just so this can go on and on and on and on. If you have a teacher in one place and he is the only teacher, he's limited in how many people he can reach. You, you know people that I'll never, ever meet in my life. I'm confident of that. People that you'll see, people that you know, people you're related to, I'll, I'll never have a chance to meet them. So, what's your responsibility? To try to save them, to try to reach out to them, whoever they are, wherever they are. We have that responsibility. So, God's one purpose in writing the Bible, as we've looked at all quarter long, from the Old Testament all the way through the Gospels, those missionary sermons from the missionary record of the book of Acts, the missionary correspondence in these letters to churches we looked at last week, to evangelists this week, is to reach out to man. God wants to. That's God's purpose. He was under no obligation to do this, but it's moved and motivated by the grace of God that He was going to try to reach out and save man. We ought to be thankful to God every day for that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you have reached out to us. Thank you so much for giving us the word, giving us the direction for our life, and we pray for your forgiveness when we fail, when we misstep, when we arrogantly or stubbornly refuse to do what you want us to do. Lord, we know that you hold the answer and that we'll be blessed now and eternally by following in your will. Thank you for reaching out. Thank you for giving us Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. And amen.